Welcome to the March 2019 edition of This Month in Payroll. I'm Rowan Geddes, the Australian lead for PwC's payroll consulting practice. The first quarter of 2019 is complete, and for many of us, year-end is in sight. March was a quiet month, with a budget due in early April, and also the next round of the casual double-dipping rate cases to be heard. However, there were a few helpful releases from the tax office and fair work that we'll talk about this month. The tax office covered superannuation on leave loading, provided more black economy legislative initiatives, and also further guidance on how single-touch payroll will apply to shadow payrolls. They have also launched an employee onboarding initiative, which hopes to make life easier for employers. And from Fair Work, they issued a publication, Assisting Parties to Make Compliant Agreements, which provides their views on the EA process and lists 20 errors to avoid when creating a new enterprise agreement. Superannuation on annual leave loading. Is annual leave loading subject to superannuation guarantee? This question has been a hot topic for the last year, ever since the tax office updated its website to state that annual leave loading will not be ordinary time earnings only if it is demonstrably referable to a notional lost opportunity to work overtime. All other annual leave loading will be subject to superannuation guarantee. While this view is consistent with the view expressed by the Commissioner in Superannuation Guarantee Ruling SGR 2009-2, the original guidance on the website could be interpreted differently, and the update to the ATO's website prompted questions from many employers who had been operating in accordance with that original guidance. This month, the tax office provided insight into their compliance approach to dealing with this issue. In the release, they recognised the uncertainty that they had created and so offered that they would not dedicate compliance resources to reviewing historic leave loading payments made by an employer, provided, one, there is a reasonable basis for the employer having concluded that the payments of leave loading were attributable to the lost opportunity to work overtime, and two, that there is no evidence over the preceding five years which indicates leave loading was paid for a reason other than overtime. Therefore, if you are an employer who has not been paying SG on leave loading payments over the last five years, you should now assess the validity of this position. This would include identifying any relevant documentary evidence, such as contracts, awards, agreements, policies, or also work practices, which support the basis that leave loading payments are paid as compensation for the lost opportunity to earn overtime payments. The situation from a go-forward basis is stricter. Prospectively, it will be critical to have documented clearly the purpose for paying the leave loading, whether this be pursuant to employment contracts, awards or agreements, or under other documentation, such as employee policies. In the absence of the clarity in these documents, the tax office has indicated that annual leave loading should be treated as ordinary time earnings and accordingly subjected to superannuation guarantee, and they will review this process. The issue of SG on leave loading remains a vexed one. While the ATO has confirmed that they will not launch SG audits on this matter, that is still dependent on employers having a basis for arguing that the leave loading they pay is related to the lost opportunity to receive paid overtime. And looking forward, that reason must be documented. In addition, we note that even if the tax office chooses not to audit a prior year, that same concessionary position may not be followed by Fair Work, who have been silent on this matter, or the unions. The Black Economy. We spoke last month about legislative changes, such as making payments to contractors non-deductible if no ABN is captured, which were designed to reduce the impact of the black economy. Following the same path, the tax office released a report earlier heralding the success of its taxable payments reporting system, TPRS, which, it stated, had successfully protected $2.7 billion from being lost to the black economy in the building and construction industry in the 2015-16 financial year. Businesses in building and construction are required to lodge a TPRS annual report each year on any payments to contractors and subcontractors within the industry. This data allows the tax office to identify contractors who fail to lodge returns or activity statements, fail to register for GST, use false AVNs, or fail to report all of their income to the tax office. Following a recommendation from the Black Economy Task Force, the TPRS has now been extended to seven more industries which the task force has identified as high risk for black economy activity. Cleaning and courier industries are captured in 2018-19, meaning that businesses that supply courier or cleaning services will need to report payments made to the contractors they use to deliver those services using the TPRS annual report, which is due by 28 August 2019. In 2019-20, the following industries will also fall within the TPRS rules. Road freight, information technology, security, investigation, and surveillance services. 
The other black economy legislation that was introduced is not directly relevant to payroll, but does go to the government's focus on arresting the black economy leakage. This new legislation will affect businesses that tender for Commonwealth government procurement contracts in excess of $4 million. From 1 July 2019, these businesses will be required to have a satisfactory statement of tax record issued by the Australian Tax Office. The statement of tax record is a statement issued by the tax office that indicates whether or not a business has a tax record that is satisfactory, based on the following factors. One, the entity is up to date with its registration requirements, including being registered for an Australian business number and the GST, and having a tax file number. Two, the entity has lodged on time, or by an extended due date, at least 90% of all income tax returns, FBT returns, and business activity statements that were due in the last four years, or for a business that has been operating for less than four years since they've been operating. And three, on the date that the statement of tax record is issued, the entity does not have $10,000 or more in overdue debt due to the tax office, excluding debt subject to a taxation objection, review, or appeal. Single-touch payroll obligations for shadow payrolls. Last month, I provided an update about the single-touch payroll reporting obligations for expatriate employees. As mentioned, we have been seeking clarity from the tax office on a number of matters, such as the impact of an employer being unable to collate and calculate the foreign payroll information required within the extended one-month due date. Coming out of those discussions, we can advise that the tax office is considering whether a longer transitional deferral is appropriate for all employers for the FY20 year. It is also noted that there will be the opportunity in exceptional circumstances for an employer to make an application to the tax office if additional time is required beyond the automatic deferral. In addition, there is likely to be an automatic deferral until 14 August for lodgements of the finalisation report for shadow payrolls. Automated employee commencement. As the tax office continues to digitise its activities, one welcome move is that some employee commencement forms have now been made available online to help streamline the onboarding process for employees and employers. The online forms are tax file number declaration, superannuation standard choice, withholding declaration, and Medicare levy variation declarations. Under the streamlined process, employee information such as their residency status, education loans, and existing superannuation fund details will be pre-filled into the online forms, reducing the likelihood of incorrect information being provided to an employer and errors such as the employee having the incorrect amount of tax withheld. Employees will be able to access and, co and complete pre-filled commencement forms via MyGov, although employees will still need to talk to the employer before they use these forms because they will need to know their employer's ABN and the employer's default superannuation fund details. If employers want to offer the online process directly to the employees, they can do so, but they will need to check with a software provider to see whether the payroll technology has been updated to allow for this new service. The tax office has made the specifications available for software developers to build the service into their system. However, the process is not completely online. Once the forms are complete, employees will still need to print them and provide them to their employer so that the employer can enter the information into their system and keep a copy of the form for their records. On the positive side, at least employers do not need to send the printed forms off to the ATO. More detail about these forms and the process can be found online at ato.gov.au under the Onboarding a New Employee tab. Finally. Fair Work this month released a guide entitled Assisting Parties to Make Compliant Agreements. This guide talks about the number of enterprise agreements that Fair Work receives each year, more than 5,000, and the turnaround time for approvals, between 32 and 76 days. It also highlights some of the common defects found in enterprise agreements, including annual leave entitlements being expressed in hours or days rather than weeks, and equating to less than the required amount of leave, e.g. four weeks of paid annual leave. This response is directly linked to the Mondelez case handed down by Fair Work last year. Secondly, the agreement not providing for carers leave for casual employees. Casual employees are entitled to two days unpaid carers leave. Third, the agreement listing all public holidays, but then not including public holidays in other states and territories. And tellingly, fourth, the inclusion of loaded rates of pay without being able to adequately show that the loaded rate will be sufficient to pass the better off overall test. Enterprise agreements with loaded rates has been one of the common sources of remediation cases that we have supported employers with in recent times. So finding this as a common error in negotiating new agreements is something that is expected. And that's it for this month in payroll. I hope you find our updates a valuable way for staying up to date with changes impacting payroll. If you have any questions, you can find information on our website, pwc.com.au forward slash payroll or email me at rowan.gettys at pwc.com or message me via LinkedIn. Thanks very much. Have a great month.